believe tonight that most of you will agree with me that the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is the greatest story that has ever been told, the greatest story that has ever been written, and it still remains to be the greatest of them all. And within that gospel story, we find the encounter of Jesus with the demoniac of the land of Gadara. We've been looking at it from Luke chapter 8. After he was cleansed and clothed, the Lord commissioned him in verse 39. He said, I want you to go and tell what great things that God hath done for thee. And so we began in this series of messages, and we've noticed together how that he, can, how that he could go and tell that he had seen a great light. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, and we find that Matthew, he's repeating the words of Isaiah 42, verses 6 and 7. The people that sat in the shadow of death, and they were there seated in darkness, they have seen a great light. And of course, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. And when Jesus stepped on the shore of that demon-possessed man, the light of the world stepped on shore. And then he could go and tell about his great love. Ephesians chapter 2 at verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, with his great love wherewith he hath loved us, a love that is looking beyond our faults and seeing our needs, a love that is lasting, a love that we can count on no matter what our situation or our circumstance might be, a love that is lifting. It will lift us out of our situation and plant our feet on higher ground. But now we're noticing together that he could go and tell about the Lord's great faithfulness. Listen to Jeremiah once again, Lamentations chapter 3, 21 through 23. This is from the weeping prophet. This I recall to mind, and therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we have not been consumed. His compassions, they fell not. They are new every morning. Listen now, and great is thy faithfulness. From the New Testament, the Apostle Paul echoes back to Jeremiah. And he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer with him, we're going to reign with him. If we deny him, well, he will deny us. Verse 13, if we believe not. I love this. He abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Isn't it good to know? that no matter what's going on in the world and no matter how much faith I have at this moment, he abideth faithful, he's consistent, he cannot deny himself. And so in this great faithfulness, we've noticed first of all, he's faithful to fight for us. Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Moses led Israel out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage, and now they come to the Red Sea and Pharaoh's right on their trail, and it seems like they are trapped. And listen to what Moses does. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For this day, the Lord is going to fight for you. How many will verify that the Lord's fought a lot of battles for you? A lot of battles we didn't even have to turn our hand to, but he's been faithful to fight for us and how we ought to bless his name. Now in the New Testament, Paul puts it this way, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 at verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation, I like it, to them that trouble you. And so we don't have to get our hands dirty. He is faithful to fight for us. But in this message, let's notice now, he's faithful to forgive us. Turn with me in your Bibles over to 1 John chapter 1. These are premier verses of Scripture in the Word of God, and I want them to be a blessing to you here in 1 John chapter 1, beginning here at verse 7. The best way to find 1 John, go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Turn back to your left. You'll come to Jude, and you'll come then to 3 John, 2 John, 1 John chapter 1, beginning there at verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all of our sin. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, but if we confess our sin, he's what? 
He is faithful and just to cleanse us from our sin. Oh my, what a blessing that we find here in the faithfulness of the Lord to forgive us. Let's get a good biblical definition of the word forgiveness. And I want you to have this in your mind. If you don't take anything else away, I want you to have this particular definition in your mind. It is the gracious and the legal act of God in completely and fully pardoning uh, the repentant sinner that realizes and recognizes that Jesus has paid our sin debt. Now listen to it once again. It is the gracious and legal act of God in completely and fully pardoning uh, the sinner that is repentant and realizes and recognizes that Jesus paid our sin debt. How many is thankful that Jesus paid it all? John 19 and 30, one of the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross, and it's one that we ought to hold on to. And Jesus cried out, it is finished. Simply saying, the debt is paid in full. And we ought to rejoice in the fact that the debt is paid in full. Right here on our playground in our Christian school, two of our little boys the other day, they were into it. And so when I walked through the gate, I saw it, and I went over to them, and I said, hey, fellas, what's going on? Nothing, nothing. We're just having an argument. I said, well, you don't put your hands on one another when you're arguing. I think it was going a little bit further than an argument. I want you to forgive one another and shake hands. And the one little fellow looked up at me and he said, Preacher, I'll shake hands, but I ain't ready to forgive. <laughs> oh, my. That's the way we are many times, aren't we? But listen to what the psalmist says over there in the 86 Psalms at verse 5. He said, The Lord is good, ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy to all them that call upon Him. Listen to it once again. How many believes the Lord is good? And Hammy believes that he's ready to forgive and he's plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon him. And listen to Jeremiah, 31st chapter, verse 34, and Paul repeats it in Hebrews chapter 10 at verse 17. And the Bible says that he forgives us and he forgets our sins. Now we have the ability many times to be able to forgive. And our forgiveness of one, of one another is always based upon the fact that the Lord has forgiven us. And because we're in debt to Him, we're in debt to forgive others. And so He has the ability not only to forgive us, but also the ability to forget all about our sins. Let me tell you the story from the New Testament. And it's one that I know that most of us will remember. It's found in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And we find that Jesus is at Capernaum. And that it was his missionary headquarters in the northern part of Israel, right there on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. And so he was in the house, and he had been healing people. And people were crowding in to see him and trying to get to him. And so four men carried a paralyzed man on a stretcher cot. And so when they got there, they couldn't get in either. And so they went up and they broke up the roof and they let the paralyzed man right down in front of Jesus. And in verse 5 of Mark chapter 2, the first thing that Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now there were scribes in the house and they were the legal eagles of Judaism. And when they heard that, they began to reason in themselves. Uh, they didn't say anything out loud, but they were thinking it. It was going on in their minds. And I want to remind you of something. The Lord not only knows what I, we say, He knows what we want to say. And so we need to guard our thoughts, don't we? And my dad used to teach the lesson, before you say anything, William Boyd, when he would correct me, you need to do a little survey. Is it kind? Is it true? Would I want it said about me? And so Jesus, he perceived their thoughts. And he said to those scribes, those legal eagles of Judaism, he said to them, I want to ask you a question. Which is easier for me to say? Thy sins be forgiven thee, or take up thy bed and walk. And they had no answer. He said, so you will know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. 
I say to this paralyzed man, take up your bed and walk. And immediately he arose and took up his bed and he went out of the house. They didn't know what to say to him. But in verse 12, all the people were amazed and they glorified God and watch what they said. We've never seen it on this fashion before. This is the fashion I've been wearing as a preacher ever since I started preaching, and I'm not going to change now. I'm not going to wear jeans with the knees out of them. I'm not going to spike my hair as short and stocky and fat as my little face is. I look like a, a, a bowling ball, a porcupine with a spurs sticking out of it everywhere. And so it's not fashionable, I know, with the modern-day church, but that doesn't matter to me. It's still fashionable for me. And so let's go back to the demoniac. Verse 35 of Luke chapter 8, he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. I believe he was right in fashion. And I believe tonight if you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, according to the economy of heaven, not according to the fashion standards down here, you're right in style, brother. You are right in style. They'd never seen it on that fashion before. Now remember, this is God's gracious act. It is His gracious and it is His legal act toward us that He will pardon our sins fully and completely when we are repentive and when we recognize and realize that Jesus is our substitute. He died in our place and He died for our benefit. You know the verses that I love so much. I quote them to you often. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He who knew no sin he was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Now, here's the great Bible doctrine. And not much doctrine being preached today. And we know that people are going to turn their ears away from sound doctrine. They're going to be turned to fables, having itching ears. They're going to heap to themselves teachers. And that's found over there in 2 Timothy chapter 4. But he tells us to be instant in season and out of season. That's what I'm going to do. The great doctrine of imputation. That means it's put on my account. It's imputed to me. Amputation means to take away. Imputation means to add to. And so we're there in Romans chapter 4 at verse 24 that imputation happens when we believe on him that raised Jesus from the dead. And verse 25 says, He was delivered for our offenses. And he was raised again for our justification. And I know many that are watching, they don't know the old song, but I know it. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day is coming, oh glorious day. I'm thankful that it's been placed upon my record according to even what Abraham did in Genesis chapter 15 at verse 6. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness a long time before he was willing to take Isaac to be a sacrifice. He believed God. That's all we have to do is to believe God. And then that pardon can come to us when we repent of our sins and we realize in our hearts and minds that Jesus is the legal sacrifice and God accepted his sacrifice in our place and for our benefit. Here's an interesting verse of Scripture. It's found in Acts chapter 5 at verse 31. And we find that Peter and the other followers have been brought in before the Jewish Senate. And I know this is a little dated, and right now there's a senatorial hearing going on about the next Supreme Court Justice of the United States of America. And so they're asking some, little, uh, uh, some legitimate questions about some of her judicial rulings because she's already a setting federal judge. And so they're asking some questions about that. But they brought them in, and they warned them not to preach or teach anymore in the name of Jesus. And that all started back in Acts chapter 4. Peter and John on the way to the temple at the hour of prayer. They come to the gate called Beautiful, and there's the crippled man. And he's begging for alms, and they declare to him, Silver and gold have we none. 
but such as we have given unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he went into the temple leaping and, and walking and praising God and everybody saw it and a crowd gathered and Peter gives these words right there among all the Judaizers and he says, neither is there salvation in any other. No other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 at verse 12. And so they brought them in before the Jewish Senate and said, don't you preach or teach anymore in the name of Jesus. That didn't stop them. And so when they continue to do so, you'll find there in the fifth chapter that they put them in prison. And there was a jailbreak. An angel went down and got them out of prison. And when they got out of prison, they still didn't stop. They went right back to preaching in the name of Jesus. And so they bring them in again before the Jewish Senate. And here they are. And listen to Peter's answer. The once denier that denied the Lord three times, the night before he's crucified. Listen to what he says in verse 29. We ought to obey God rather than men. I like that, don't you? And that needs to be the standard of every child of God today. We ought to obey God rather than be suitable and compromise with this old world. This old world is temporary and everybody living in it, but I'm thankful that we've got a hold and it's got a hold of us, someone that is absolutely eternal and unchanging and we can say, great is thy faithfulness. And standing right there before the Jewish Senate, what bravery, what boldness. In Acts chapter 5, at verse 31, that Peter says, God hath highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, by his own right hand to be prince and savior and to give repentance to Israel, even the forgiveness of sins. Oh, I'm telling you, we should be thankful that Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of the Father and even now we can have the spirit of repentance and we can receive the forgiveness of sin. Don't forget about it in the previous messages, Acts 20, 21, and Paul tells the Ephesian elders, I went about day and night. I didn't stop. I warned every man with tears, preaching repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Another New Testament example is found in Luke chapter 7. And there in the 7th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is invited to supper by a Pharisee by the name of Simon. And when he arrives at Simon's house, they sit down to meet. And I could tell you a little bit about that, but not right now. And so when they were set down to meet, I believe it was Mary Magdalene. I believe it was Mary Magdalene according to Mark chapter 16 at verse 9, out of whom seven devils were cast. I believe it was Mary Magdalene that met the risen Lord in John chapter 20 and became the first proclaimer of the resurrection. And she came in with her box of perfume and she came in with her tear bottle, and she knelt down at the feet of Jesus, and she anointed him, and she washed his feet with her tears, and she let her hair down in front of the men, which was not the occasion to do so, but she did it anyway. And it was really against Jewish law. She was supposed to remain covered, and she took her hair and dried his feet, and Simon was sitting there at the table, and he looked down his long, snooty, self-righteous nose, and he said within himself again, if this man were truly a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. But she worshiped extravagantly. And so Jesus said, Simon, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. He made a mistake. He said, Lord, say on. He said, there was a certain creditor that had two debtors. One, he had loaned a hundred pence. The other that he had loaned, 50 pence. And there in Luke 7 at verse 42, the Bible says, and he frankly forgave both of them of their indebtedness, complete, full, pardon, exonerated completely. You don't owe me anything any longer. He frankly forgave both of them. Simon, I want to ask you a question. Which one of those men should love him the most? He said, I'm glad you gave me a multiple choice. And he said, I suppose the one that owed the most. He said, you've answered correctly. And you see, this woman, she's been forgiven of great sins. And because she's been forgiven of great sins, she loveth much. 
And I want to tell everybody in this room, we've been forgiven of great sins. And the greatest sin of all is that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. And this is condemnation that men have failed to believe upon the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's what condemns us. And then over there in Romans 3.23, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord is eternal life. I'm telling you, we owed a debt we could not pay, but bless His high and holy name, He paid a debt He did not owe. And He cried out on the cross, it it is finished. Listen to Paul in Colossians chapter 1 after he describes the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. All things made by him, for him, and through him. All things consist. Colossians 1, 15 through 16. And then he gets down there to verse 17 after he says by him all things consist. Verse 18, he is the head of the body the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things, he, the head of the church, the head of the body, firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the what? The preeminence. There is none other that has the power to forgive our sins legally. Oh, listen to it graciously. He fully and completely pardons us. When we have a repentant spirit, and we realize and recognize that Jesus was our sin bearer and he fully paid the debt for us. Let's look together in our Bibles, right over in the middle of the 103rd Psalms. As we're going that way toward the 103rd Psalms, let me quote the first five verses to it. Uh, this 103rd Psalms, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thine diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. But listen to what he says beginning at verse 10. Here's what we can all say, bless the Lord, O, o my soul, over. He says, he will not always chide in verse 9. And will, he will not always keep his anger forever. But he hath not dealt with us after our sins, aren't you glad? Nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And east and west never meet again. There's a north and a south pole, but no east and west pole. It just keeps on going like the scapegoat that was released to the wilderness, never to return again. Listen to verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And then listen to what he says in verse 14. For he knoweth my frame, and he remembereth that we are but dust. And you're sitting here tonight, said preacher, I've not committed any real big sins lately. Let me quote to you James 4, 17. To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is what? It is sin. I think we've got some repenting to do. I don't pray enough. I don't tell it enough. And Brother Jackson used to sing this old song to us. I don't pray enough. I don't tell it enough. I don't love my neighbor as I should enough. When I pause to remember what he's done for me, how can I not serve the Lord? He is worthy of our service. And even when we're lazy in our Christian life, even when we're lazy in our prayer life, even when we're lazy in our study life, I'm thankful that he's still there, not dealing with us after our sins, wanting the Holy Spirit to brood over us and to convict us and show us that we've been lazy toward God were to bless his high and holy name. And I want to suggest tonight that no one here in this room and probably no one watching is guilty of being beyond the forgiveness of God. If you're concerned that you've committed the unpardonable sin, that's a sure and certain sign that you've never done it. And every other sin, he is absolutely willing and ready to forgive. It's been some years back, and Dad and I, we were called to the Middlesbrough Hospital, and the nurse said, Preacher Bingham, there's a lady here that wants to see you. 
and she's dying. And I took him up there and drove him. We went into the room together. And she said, Preacher, do you remember me? He said, Sweetheart, you'll have to help me. A lot of years have passed by and I don't see too well. You'll have to help me. She said, In 1944, you held a revival right here in, in the area. And said it was a great revival. Said there were over a hundred adults saved in that revival. And I was convicted and I needed to be saved. But said during World War II, 1944, she said I had on a new pair of silk stockings. And when conviction was upon me and the Holy Spirit was drawing me and I knew that I'd sinned, I was afraid to go and kneel in that old rough board altar. I was afraid that I would put a pick and a runner in my new stockings. And all these years, that's kept me from being saved. He said, sweetheart, you can be saved now. She said, oh no, I've gone too far. I I've hardened my heart. I I've calloused myself. I don't think I can ever be saved. And for over an hour, he pleaded with her. He begged with her. And she kept saying over and over again, I've gone too far. I've gone too far. I want to tell you, in her stubbornness, she thought that she'd gone too far. But the 59th chapter of the book of Isaiah says, His arm is not shortened, and his ear is not deafened, and our God is still able to save. And I want to tell you, no matter what path you're on, ready and willing, the prodigal son's father gives us a picture of our God. And he was looking down that long road for that boy to return. And when he finally saw that figure and said, that walks like my son, but he's a mess. I believe that is my son. He ran to meet him and fell on his neck. And full and complete pardon was given to that son. I'm thankful it's still available to everyone that will call upon his name with a repentant heart, recognizing and realizing that Jesus paid it all. Father, I pray that you'll take this simple Bible message and Lord, that we will see your faithfulness in forgiving our sins. Lord, how faithful and just you are to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. We bless your name. Now, Father, I pray that someone will come tonight with a repentant heart, recognizing and realizing they can never redeem themselves. They can never make up uh, for it before you and before your throne. Help them to realize that there's only way, one way, and that's the blood way. Bring them, I pray, Father, and we'll give you the glory. Let's stand together.